Gravity Falls is one of the smartest, funniest, and coolest animated shows ever to exist. Even I can't quite believe some of the guest stars we've gotten over the course of this series. I feel very proud and grateful that I was able to drop by and play Probabilitor the Annoying in the Dungeons, Dungeons, and More Dungeons episode. I had the privilege of voicing the role of Multi Bear in Gravity Falls season one and two. He was scary and scared, funny and touching all at the same time, and uh, it was a lot of fun to do. I play uh, Preston Northwest on Gravity Falls. I have a really good time being included in a very talented group. It's been an amazing chance to work with some of my personal heroes. Much love to Alex and the cast and crew of Gravity Falls. Here's to a fantastic finale. And I always have a good time when I go down to Gravity Falls. My heart's in Gravity Falls. No one ever could enchant us in the way that Gronk will stand us. If we're lucky and we're able, we can find Dipper and Mabel. Take me back to the place I know With the mystery shack and the forest gnomes I'm already back, so come on, let's go Don't get me started, my heart's in gravity falls Welcome to Mystery Shack Look Back, a nostalgic time capsule and no-spoiler book club of the original Gravity Falls fandom. We are your curators. I am Ella. I'm Charlie! Oh my goodness! This is a momentous occasion, Ella! It really is! It is the 10-year anniversary of this, this really amazing, immersive, paranormal series that has had such a huge fandom. What show is that? That's the Welcome to Night Vale, the podcast, came out June 15th. That's right. Well, but wait, Ella. Wait, oh, we're forgetting something. There was something on Disney Channel, wasn't there? Yes. June 15th, 2012 was a rather large premiere on Disney Channel. That's right. It was the original movie, Let It Shine, that was aired 10 years ago today. To Here to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of both Welcome to Night Vale and Let It Shine, we have all three Fahuqua gods. Say hi, David Spencer! Hello, Desert Bluffs. Say hi, Michael Hunter! Hello there. Say hi, Alexa Quizon! Hello, podcast reference. It is so <laughs> nice to have the three hosts of Come On for Hugo Pods talking to us about... Wait. Oh my oh. gosh! It's the 10-year <laughs> anniversary of Gravity Falls! Oh, that's cool. I know! It is cool! Oh, wait! Oh, wait! The reason Hang this on. podcast wait. exists, Charlie! Wait! That's today! This day! Wait, the, po- <laughs> well, the podcast exists? Are we doing anything for it? Well, we're recording a podcast! About which episode? About the, the, the finale, actually. The finale of <gasps> Gravity Falls. We're record- we're releasing the finale of Gravity Falls! On the 10-year anniversary of the show's premiere, yeah! I am downright and uplift impatient to just hop into this. Do- do any of our docents have any- uh, uh, it, Speak now or forever hold your mother- Yeah! 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 yeah. Peace! Uh, I- I spent the last- <laughs> three weeks just binging every episode of Welcome to Night Vale. I thought that's that's what we were going to be talking about. Well, I'm sorry, David. You wasted your time. Uh, but yeah. if you have any questions for us, uh, now would be the time. Uh, Michael, you wanted to ask about Let It Shine? Yeah, I wanted to ask about Let It Shine, but uh, I, I, I'm going to just stifle my questions. We'll put them, put them away. Are you free on Thursday? Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk about let's talk about let it shine. I wanted to know. Well, I I just had a, a question that I know I've talked to both of you a little bit off mic about, but I would love for it to hear. But now you're on. Mike. Yeah. Um, this is a thing that I feel like doesn't happen too much with with podcasts or with a lot of internet media, where it's just like designed to just keep going on into forever and and then when when like tv shows end people are upset and they they don't want it to end but creators are usually like no i'm ready i'm ready to move on to the new thing so i'm curious how do you guys feel uh that you're coming close to the end of this i will i will tell you exactly a week before this episode aired Ella and I released What Probably Happens in Weird Mageddon Part 3, which was the first finale I ever made as a creator. Mm, wow. And I was like, why did I ever make infinite shows before? <laughs> this is dope as yeah. yeah. I, like, I could never, I never, I never have the, the fortitude to plan something that does not have an end point in mind. I think that's just how I create things. But like, 
endings are so fun to make because yeah. I can say things that would have made you laugh 20 episodes ago that might make you cry today. Exactly. And the power I feel as a producer, <laughs> like we did that with uh, with the day the Big Mouth died. That's a bunch of our inside mm-hmm. jokes. But mm-hmm. because it is with the lens of nostalgia, it's a little melancholy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's super easy to take anything funny and just turn it into sad. It's almost like it's almost like tra- Tragedy equals comedy plus, plus time. time. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> and you know what? Bojack and Mr. Peanut Butter finally had that the crossover episode. episode. <laughs> it turns out that anything can just become meaningful, even if it's total nonsense, <laughs> as long as you make it someone's childhood and then wait a thirty. I forget what show it was. It might have been. It might have been. No, I just watched the season three finale of Stranger Things to get caught up. And I'm like, this made me so emotional the first time I watched, you know, them moving away from Hawkins. And now I'm like, I don't have investment in these characters because I skipped to a finale and none of this is meaningful to me anymore. I, I couldn't tell if Ella was subtweeting uh, Stranger Things or Chip and Dale right there. I, I was subtweeting Rise of Skywalker. Oh, oh got it. Got it. <laughs> There's a lot of things Chewy, that you could be subtweeting. Chewy got his medal. I'm going to cry for some reason. <laughs> ah, this is nonsense. I hate Rise of Skywalker. Ape finally got his stupid gold medal. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick before we jump into the episode... Uh, we have fan mail. Hey, guys, I like your stuff. Thank you, fan mail. Aww. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, that's that's our good friend Johnny fan mail here. <laughs> <laughs> the character that has been in all 48 episodes of this podcast. Hey, Johnny, Johnny, what you bring for us today? Hey, guys. Aw, that's what the fans have been waiting for. Just yeah. hasn't spoken Johnny until Fan, this they were episode. like, Johnny Fan Mail's replying to our emails. Why haven't we heard him on the podcast yet? <laughs> and we were like, you're so right. Um, <laughs> it's because he charges too much. Um, yeah, he's like, he's a lot, he's, he's a lot like this generation's big mouth Billy Bass that way. Too soon. Oh, oh sorry. Too sorry. Soon. <laughs> Don't say his name in vain. Uh, this one comes to us from Amelia. To our email, uh, mysteryshacklookback at gmail.com. And it says, Dear Charlie and Ella, I love your podcast. Also, happy 10-year anniversary, Gravity Falls. Also, I can't believe by now Journal 3 would be over 40 years old. Uh, Have a good day, and may the memories of Gravity Falls be preserved in peanut brittle. From Amelia, loyal Gravity Falls fan. Yes. That's uh, I I don't usually get references to that episode. Usually, it's like reality is an illusion, or like Dipper's internet history. Right, right, right. Or or something something like this. I or something like this iTunes review from Harbrand twenty twenty two, uh, who who responded to our in character five star review challenge with Gravity Falls. Good to be back. And the host and hostess of this podcast, Charlie Marlowe and Ella Chesery, are awesome. They're a break fourth wall moments. I have to go. Don't forget to buy some gold. Bye. And that is quite similar to our iTunes review from Spooderman or Spooderman. Yeah. He he does whatever a Spooder. Presumably can do whatever a Spooder can. Yeah. But we assume that Spooderman is a man uh, who has the abilities of, of a, a Spooder. Spooder. Yeah. And Spooderman says... Wow, I've been alive for millennia, and this podcast is amazing! While I find my next pawn, I listen to these meatbags talk about the enemy while I make my dear teeth thrown. Wow, ukulele and pirate hat! Expect a visit from me soon! Ooh, I I like that we've been assigned our own symbols. Those are really accurate. Yeah. When I first read this review, I, I beamed when I saw those, yeah. and I was like, that would be our symbols! Yeah! Uh, one other thing I wanted to establish before uh, we get to the Gravity Falls season two finale and series finale is that before this aired, uh, not not too long before this aired, there was a special that aired on Disney XD called Between the Pines. <laughs> and this was really cool because it was just a half hour of Alex Hirsch and the Time Baby just talking about uh, Gravity Falls, like fun facts and lore. And, oh, that's and amazing. <laughs> um, and, and it's it. The reason I don't feel like we need to dedicate that much time to it is because it's a lot of stuff that we have already covered Mm -hmm. and it's like yeah people have asked us like oh are you gonna cover between the pines and we're like yeah we could cover 
uh, behind the scenes information. Oh wait, we do that every episode, <laughs> and a lot of it is like from between relatively lines, yeah. relatively surface level, but it is really interesting, and it's a it's on the DVD. I don't think it's on Disney Plus, but it's worth finding. Um, it's a, it's an entertaining little little special, and it's cool that like to me it symbolizes like at the eleventh hour. Disney recognizing the scope, the scope of this <laughs> fandom, and being like, "Oh, they, we need to do like uh, behind the scenes that you know we need to do all this mm-hmm. stuff. We and need to do our this- own Talking Dead." Yeah, I remember. Mm-hmm. I remember mm-hmm. Hot Topic got filled with um with Dipper hats in like 2017, 2018. It's like that's good. Yeah. That's close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you could have released it somewhere before February fifteenth, uh, twenty sixteen, right. which is when Weird Mageddon Part Three, the twentieth episode of Gravity Falls Season Two, the fortieth episode overall, and the hour long. If you're watching it with commercials, don't worry, Michael. <laughs> episode of the series. <laughs> it was directed by Steven Sandoval. It was written by Shion Takeuchi, Mark Rizzo. Jeff Rowe, Josh Weinstein, and Alex Hirsch. And although the full title is Weird Mageddon 3, Take Back the Falls, uh, the second half of the hour-long episode is sometimes broadcast as Weird Mageddon 4, somewhere in the woods uh, in re-airings or for half-hour programming as well as on Disney+. Plus. That is the title of that second half. But let's watch both of them. At the s- no, not at the same time. At the same time! One right after the other. <laughs> as if they were one episode, I think you meant. Yes, that is exactly what I meant. Let's do it! David! Michael! Alexa! Are you ready to have no more Gravity Falls left to view? I don't know. I don't know. Put it like that. Okay, let's go! go. (laughs) It all started a lifetime ago. You and me are gonna sail away from this dumb town. Our parents decided we could use some fresh air. Be amazed! Bloopity bloop! Twins! What's up, Hambone? Everything I've worked for, it's all for this family. This mystery shack is over forever. The mystery you don't want to end. There's a town in need of saving. Is the finale you don't want to miss. I just wish summer could last forever. Hello, I am the Dread Pirate Charlie. Please join me in a star-studded cast for Princess Bride. A table reading of the original screenplay. This Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at twitch.tv slash captain underscore Diablos. That's D-Y-A-B-L-O-S, or just follow the link in the description. So we just watched the final episode of Gravity Falls, ten years after (laughs) Gravity Falls first aired. We're going to get in part three. Before we get into the discussion, Alexa, I actually have something to read for you. Okay. This is an excellent text. I'm a big fan. It it reads, Grunkle Stan, uh, I think he's going to do something very noble. Like, he's going to be like, ah, and then he's going to sacrifice, like, his arm or something. I feel there was a loved one. And, you know... Maybe that person is not in the picture anymore. I thought that Grunkle Stan and his significant other wrote the journal together. <gasps> that person that uh, is no longer in the picture disappeared. I see that th- this is r- this is an interesting hand. One, two, three. From our knowledge, the six-fingered uh, being is usually a villain. What if the six-fingered person is the significant other of Grunkle Stan, <laughs> Alexa Quizon, June 5th, 2021, after viewing only the first episode of Gravity Falls? TV is not a hobby. It is a game. And Alexa, you are the winner! Yay! <laughs> I love about the Alexa theorizing. I mean, I, I love a lot of things about whenever Alexa shows up in anything, Thank you. of course. Mm-hmm. But uh, number one, I, I sure hope nobody thinks it's faking. It's like just untrue enough that it couldn't possibly f- be faked. <laughs> and absolutely, absolutely, that is 100% genuine. Yeah. Uh, but I also, I also love that there's a certain view of um, the kind of of people who want to uh, solve a TV show or a movie as opposed <laughs> to just enjoy it. And it gives me 
a, a, a real nice sense of like schadenfreude joy that the person who could really solve these television shows after just the first episode is somebody who is nothing like the uh, yeah, the kinds of film pros cons- who not tried concerned to. With, not concerned with solving it. I yeah. hung out with um, our theme music composer, Brian Brian, briefly after recording Alexa's episode. And he pointed out that because your name has Alex in it, it's just a, a mm. sort of oh, all, just an Alex. all Alexes. Yeah, we're all intertwined. <laughs> all, no, they all no, know. How gravity so, falls. Alexa, I also posted those clips of you from that episode to re- advertise that the podcast uh, <laughs> was was coming out. And I have I have neglected to let you know that I have done that. That's okay. Well, because the conceit of the clips is that you predicted all of Gravity Falls correctly, and we couldn't let you know right, that. So you watch that, you would know what you got right. But Alexa, there is a video that is mostly just you that has. It's not giving me a view count on YouTube Shorts. A couple thousand views. It's my most successful video of the past uh, year. And it has 30 comments, oh, including wow. Yellow Pig 10 writes, yeah, this lady is the ultimate detective. Dipper needs to train under her. He could have figured <laughs> out every mystery in like two days. <laughs> Vincent Morris says her predictions weren't perfectly on point, yet pretty much everything she said correlates to something in the show. Yeah. Um, Dipper would be like, what, what, what is the pinata? Right? Oh the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the plushy splits commented, this girl just predicted Ford with 79 likes. Um, a singer eight months ago with seven likes says, okay, but why does she kind of sound like grown up Mabel? Um, <laughs> well, because you are, though. Brilliant. So that is you. Thrick sa- uh, says, what? That's a detective right there. Drift TSH says, impressive. That one forgettable face says, she got most of that right. Wow, that's weird. Cookie Huezo says, okay, this right here is a genius. Maria J. Payton says, wow, this lady is literally a superhuman. Uh, <laughs> Media Lichen says, holy schwazmoni, well that's done. That's not even a word, and I agree with you. <laughs> Mimethis says, this is insane. Jungo Guy says, dang, this girl gives Batman and Sherlock Holmes a run for their money. Yes. Golden <laughs> Rose says, how? Coyotic says, wow, that's all I have to say, wow. Miss Crystal Hood says, wrong, so, 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 so wrong. And GG27-99 says, okay, can you put me in touch with her? I'm really curious about what's happening next in the Cuphead show. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's a good time to announce our Cuphead podcast. Uh, (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) Where Alexa, who has never seen Cuphead, predicts it and somehow gets all of it right. Yeah. And it's not a viewing podcast. It's just where Alexa sits down and guesses what happens in each episode. I why I don't know why I was tearing up hearing that just because. Oh my goodness. I mean. We've all been tearing up at various stages for the past 10 minutes. I think that's pretty yeah. normal. I cried less now than my first time watching it, but my first time watching it, because I couldn't find any friends to hang out with, I actually watched it with some people on live stream, didn't realize it was recording to my hard drive. So I have access to me crying after oh, viewing this episode wow. for the first time. We'll play that clip now. Also, uh, Blubs and Durland finally admitted they're actually in love. <laughs> No, with Fusus running the shack and um, Stan uh, going on his <laughs> adventure with uh, Ford and uh, Waddles coming home with Dipper and Mabel. <laughs> Gonna go home and rethink everything. So, Michael, David, Alexa, what did you... <laughs> Think of this! I can't just play the music! I can't! Hey, Alexa, (laughs) what do you think of this? This is how you end a show. Yep. Like, this is a a, a really nice, well thought out ending to a show. I've seen, there's so many times where I've seen like the series finale of of something, and I I just felt like, okay, that, that was it. Great. Okay. Like the and third Futurama series finale. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. The first two finales were great. But then it's just like, oh boy, and here we are. Like, but this this truly felt like everything had a, a wrap up with it. Other than the president's key. 
Yeah. Oops. Yeah. He must have dropped it down a storm drain and just been so embarrassed <sighs> that he never talked about it. I spent this it. whole episode being like, bring back the president's key. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like Charlie said at the top, endings are really fun to write, but they're not very easy to write a lot of the time. No, I mean, this was definitely an all hands on deck situation with what, how, many, how many writers like are credited? Five writers or something. Yeah. I, it, was, it was interesting to see how the town kind of got reset back to normal, except for the uh, Mystery Shack. At the end of, yeah, yeah. when Weird Mageddon was reversed. Yeah. yeah. And, and well, I'm, I mean, that makes sense because the, the unicorn, unicorn hair. So when, yeah. when it was it was immune to being weirdified, but that also meant that it was immune, immune to, being to being unweirdified. Yeah, yeah. that's mm-hmm. correct. Because the damage that was done to it was not technically weird Mageddon damage. So, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And then that restoration took place over a week, along with the restoration of Grunkle Stan's mental faculties. Yeah. yeah. So f- yeah, I kind of would have been interested if they kept him as amnesiac stand. I knew you I knew you were going to say that. I knew that was going to be a point for you. But Alexa wouldn't have been and this show isn't for you, Dave. It's for her. <laughs> it's for Alex's. This is a I show for so Alex, Alex was name. like that would be too depressing and Alexa during the watching yeah. was like that would be too depressing. So as a David, you're allowed to like this show, but it's it, you know who it's for. It's <laughs> yeah. for the Alex. Exactly. It's not for you. Alex A. Yes. Perfect, perfect alternate universe thing. <laughs> I feel like, th- so the theories were abound. I know that several weeks ago at this point, we read theories about how, like, Runkle Stan is associated with a lot of, like, fire imagery and a lot of death imagery. So he might sacrifice himself. He might die. And I thought that would have been really interesting and, and, and a good way to for him to go out. And it does sort of. There's His brain goes up in flames. On with fire, hi- yeah. With a representation of him inside of it. The imagery comes back, but as far as, like, the sacrifice being a death, I thought that would work really well. But the fact that the sacrifice is total amnesia, like, forgetting everything about who he was, I'm like, oh, that's worse than death. You can undo that. I, you can, you should I mean, undo that. I mean, I I don't know if I would agree that it's worse than death, and I think that kind of goes into a conversation about, like, uh, the way we treat, uh, like, brain damage and mental health and stuff. Oh, and, no, like, yeah, I didn't mean for it yeah, to come off that yeah, way. But, I just meant, like... But I definitely see what you're... I, I definitely uh, totally, totally see what you're saying with, with that as well. And I think Charlie's right on the money that it's, like... If this were a show for me, then he would have been permanently, like, forgotten everybody. And I'm okay with it not being a show yeah, for me. Yeah, so here's what <laughs> happened. This For 40 episodes, we have been focusing on Dipper's journal, while Mabel was working on the scrapbook. The journals mm-hmm. were not important. The scrapbook mm. was. For oh. 40 episodes, we have been hyping up Stan as a screw-up and Ford as a genius. Ford ended the world, Stan saved the world. Yeah. I didn't even think about it that way. uh, I guess and another really important part about why I think it's important for Grunkle Stan to get his memories back is because up until this point, he's been constantly just narcissistic and egotistical. For Mm -hmm. an Mm -hmm. egotist to forget who he is mm, to yeah. willingly say yeah. oh, I am I'm okay well, with forgetting who not, I am. He's not as much an egotist as we first let on. We really learned he's that not, yeah. this whole time it was all about family. Well, he has a very he actually the the egotistical stuff for Stan mm-hmm. unlike Ford is really just a an external shell because True. he's been put down all his life in comparison to Ford and he, you know, his whole thing is like why not my mind's not good for anything, so use that. Like, and he was kicked out of his family's house due to a lack of success, so that is true. why that's he puts true. this absurd emphasis on money. Okay, yeah. He does need therapy, though. He needs so much. All of them. All of them. <laughs> yeah. Free therapy all for all. Yes. Uh, for I guess what I meant earlier was, like, for Stan's sacrifice to be permanent would, like, validate his sentiment that, like, oh... This is the only thing I'm good oh, for. Like, yeah. no, like you no, actually you're have totally value right. like, yeah. beyond the sacrifice. That is and a you great deserve, point. You deserve to get your memories back. You deserve to like have this life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And what I find really interesting about this finale, just as an episode of Gravity Falls, is that like, as of previous episode, Weird Mageddon Part Two, Dipper and Mabel's arc is done. Dipper and Mabel have nowhere like they. 
they Mabel accepts that she will grow up and Dipper accepts that he's not going to grow up that fast. Mm -hmm. Um, And they both come to that realization in Mabel land and they don't have any more growing to do. They just have to, their internal conflict is done. It's all external now. Defeat Bill and so we can actually like go home and have the future that we are emotionally ready for. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the protagonists of this episode are Stan and Ford. This yeah. is an episode about Grumble yeah. Stan yeah. And, and, and Ford. They are the protagonists. That is my belief. And I, I, cause Stan is the one, you know, Stan and Ford are the ones who go through the change. Yeah, absolutely. In this episode. Mm-hmm. It was about and... the other twins. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. And that's what I find really interesting is that like Dipper and Mabel's feud started way after Stan and Ford's and resolved before Stan and Ford. Like, you know, yeah, it yeah. shows how, how much healthier their their dynamic is, that they were able to start and finish their dispute in way less time yeah. than Stan and Ford. <laughs> I think that was Absolutely. important for the audience to see that, too, as well as. The brother, I don't know if they witness it. And for Stan, yeah, yeah, they Mm -hmm. follow their example. And and for Eric, one of them says, like, how do they do it? Well, they're kids. They don't know any better. Oh, that was such a good line because I definitely, there was that feeling of, I think it was Alex who said there was a total Star-Lord moment (laughs) where (laughs) there's, it's it's like that feeling of like, oh, this character's doing something stupid to the degree that it feels almost unrealistic. But for some reason, that one line made it be like, oh no, the the fact that they let the world end because of this dumb conflict actually makes sense uh, for some reason. Just Absolutely. that lens of like, oh yeah, we're old men who are holding on to old grudges and yeah. that like yeah. put it all into context. Mm-hmm. And Stan, I think, is justified in being upset right up until that point, And then you're just like, both Stan and Ford are, are, act- are being really immature. Yeah. Yes. Like, oh yes. Mm-hmm. But you get it, and that's what I, it's that kind of conflict that I love, where like you get mm-hmm. why each person is in the right and also being really, really immature. Right. If Pacifica can hold a hillbilly's hand, you know, then you yeah. <laughs> you both can work this out. You know? <laughs> and you know that that reference also makes me think about how, like, you know, yeah, it makes sense for somebody to be like the the gung ho hero of everything when they're young, and then they get old and bitter and cut themselves off from the Jedi way. And oh wait, sorry, I just just uh-huh. had to get in one more last <laughs> Jedi reference. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's it's completely relevant. Yeah, and you know because because the last Jedi. Jedi was the last Star yeah, Wars film uh-huh. that they ever uh-huh. made. They didn't do anything else yeah, after that. I know, and I honestly think, you know, you know, bringing back the prequels and the original trilogy into it in such an interesting way really was a great finale. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She, she truly was the last Jedi. Yeah. So that... <laughs> she truly was. That line, that moment uh, that you're talking about where they have their, uh, the Zodiac Circle, yeah. mm-hmm. which is the, the secret weakness to defeat Bill, and it's a human energy circuit so everyone has to hold hands and Stan is the outlier and Stan has to hold Ford's hand and uh, he says between me and him I'm not always the bad twin and Ford says between him and me grammar Stanley yeah so we'll play the clip from the commentary well uh, Stan Stan here Stan Pines (laughs) Um, the original line was I said between you and me I'm not always the bad twin and then Ford said between you and I and then Rob Renzetti here said that's wrong grammar. Yeah, we had to reverse it. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, between you and I is incorrect. Well, there's a real... That's right. F- the real life Ford is Rob. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So I insisted that... And it stayed wrong for a long time through the no, production process. No, keep it wrong. And I was like, <laughs> so this is just life footage of me and wrong. Rob fighting over yeah. I am actually not great at grammar. <laughs> and Rob was like... And I was like, but it sounds wrong. <laughs> the right one doesn't sound right for some reason. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I definitely was surprised that they would do the circle and then it wouldn't work. Yeah. Uh, I love, I, I think I even said this the last episode we recorded, that I love it when it's like, okay, we're doing all the things that is supposed to work and now something goes wrong and now what do we do? Now what? Yeah. And wouldn't you know it in what probably happens in Gravity Falls, I put in the joke that they do the circle and then Bill says, oh, I just thought it looked cool. It doesn't do it. <laughs> right? Yeah. What actually had happened was they uh, were a couple episodes in, storyboard-wise, when they started working on the theme song. Back in season one. 
So yeah. they just grabbed random assets from the storyboards, put them in a circle oh, interesting. with the six fingered hand from the journal right in the center. And at the 11th hour, Alex realized that a six fingered hand is the centerpiece of the fringe opening and was like, OK, we now need to change that. Uh, Eye of Providence. OK, cool. Oops! Mr. <laughs> Stick some Mr. Peanut arms and legs on there, you're yep. done. so I don't think Bill would have wow because at that point they had not decided whether Bill would actually show up in the show mm. or not. So I, and I don't think he would have been the main villain. No, he was not originally the main mm. villain. So I think, he definitely... But I think him being the last thing you see in the theme song was what had people theorizing that before the staff came to the decision. Mm. Yeah, and before they re- even thought that the that, that wheel meant anything. Or was anything, or or what it meant. I love it when people figure out their setups after the fact. That they're yeah. like, <laughs> gravity, and this is a lot of people talk about Gravity Falls in like Alex is a mastermind. He had a mm-hmm. a four year arc planned, and he went with it. And a lot of this podcast has been to demystify that because. I don't want our listeners to feel that they have to be smart to make good art. I, I would actually say it's 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 detrimental. And like I get why they say that because credit where it's due, I think they definitely planned more than most shows that try to do this sort of thing, I would say, and I think that's admirable. It's good to have some idea where you're going, but it's kind of impossible to know all of where you're going because stuff's going to change while you're developing the idea, mm-hmm. and that's just how art works, Yeah, and that's I, fine. I think that's like, uh, you know, the, the lesson there is that um, a great artist isn't one who has everything planned out in their brain in one thought. It's somebody who can uh, go roll with the punches and figure out yeah. what works best based off it's it's being a Stan and not a Ford. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. And he and Alex was never a Ford, and so this show was created not with one man's vision, mm-hmm. but with the teamwork of yeah. Alex exactly. Hirsch and Matt Chapman and Josh Weinstein and honestly, mostly Alonzo Ramirez Ramos. Listen, there are no <laughs> geniuses on the grip. There is one genius because <laughs> a lot of the big suggestions that led to arcs was just Alonzo like, hey, what if I drew it like this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alonzo being tasked to to be the prop designer for the portal was like, does it have anything to do with Bill? And he's like, I don't, I don't I'm not sure yet. I don't think so. Do you want me to make it look like a triangle? And he's like, uh, <laughs> Sure. Upside down so we could use that if we want. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly the kind of thing you got to be open to when, especially for something with as long of a development process as a, a TV mm-hmm. show, because, you know, obvi- obviously with a film, the audience sees that all at once, but a TV show, that is more of a time investment and, and things are going to change along the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, even even movies like that, like I remember hearing somewhere that um, the Coen brothers do not have an ending planned out when they start writing their scripts. They start down and start writing and see where it goes. And that's how like something like Fargo comes about, not from it mm. being meticulously planned, but just like, where are these characters going to take us? And and, and, and someone they, had, like... um, they had the the fans to go off of as well, because like. They didn't realize mm, yeah. that there was a demand for Wax Larry King, but this episode <laughs> entered production after 2012 when that those head cannons and fan theories started coming up, so they knew this was something the audience wanted. <laughs> head cannon. <laughs> I believe that it's something the crew wanted as well, but it's just something that the fans and the crew had in common. <laughs> well, they found that Seuss wanted to be Mr. Mystery in Little Dipper, and they found that Blubs and Durland were married gradually. The original pitch was, what if the the rookie cop is always screwing up, but the sheriff is like, oh. You're adorable. Yeah. Leave him alone. <laughs> yeah. But um, it gra- originally, it started sounding romantic, and they're like, should we curb that? And they're like, why? <laughs> yeah. So, they're mad with power. But also... Love. <sighs> While threatening police brutality, a canon gay couple. <laughs> Quality win. Happy Pride, everybody. <laughs> two cops at Pride. Uh, <laughs> only, Just well, they're these not really two. cops in that I think they don't like doing police work, and that's why they never have in the yeah. 40 episodes we've seen them. I think they needed an excuse to hang out with their spouse at work. And the sheriff's department was hiring, and the application process was easy. <laughs> Too easy. Dangerously. If anything, it's safer that they have the position and not yeah. someone who asked. They're like, hey, we're just two old gay guys who don't like working. 
why did they give us this job? <laughs> um, or if you're someone like J.J. Abrams and, and Ryan Johnson, your writing process is, okay, this happened. No, uh no, uh because this happened. No, no, because I made this happen. No, uh you didn't because I did this and that one did that. No, uh I have a shield times infinity. No, uh he died. No, uh <laughs> Yeah, J.J. Yeah, Abrams did make up, but but I'm a I'm hundred times stronger than Bill Cipher and Sans combined because I'm a, a Sans and Bill Dragon yeah. sort of deal. That's what he made. <laughs> it was an actual student who showed me his fan characters uh, he was seven years old and they were all the most powerful character from the series he under sans from undertale bill from gravity falls but they were dragons now and he described them as a hundred times more power oh. and i'm like you're gonna grow up to be jj Abrams. <laughs> that would have been a great a great twist um the bill yeah, dragon that's a hundred times more powerful shows up and defeats uh, toward the beginning of the episode when stanford is I was going to say unfrozen, but I guess un ungilded. <laughs> yeah. um, and he's in he's at the top of the pyramid in the penthouse suite. Bill sings We'll Meet Again. We'll meet again. Don't know where, don't know when. Oh, I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Which is a 1939 song by English singer Vera Lynn. Uh, written by English songwriters Ross Parker and Huey Charles. The song is one of the most famous of the World War II era, and it resonated with soldiers uh, going off to fight mm. as well as with their families and their loved ones. Well, uh, Lynn's recording from 1953 is featured uh, in an ironic way in the final scene of Stanley Kubrick's 1964 film Dr. Strangelove, accompanying a nuclear holocaust that wipes out humanity. Hmm, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Alex... <laughs> chose to include the song partially because of that association with endings and uh, apocalypses and that sort of thing. And I always read it, like, through my own interpretation as, like, Bill having this, like, pseudo-foresight for how this is all going to wrap up, and Bill, like, maybe he doesn't know how things are going to end, but in his, like, I-know-lots-of-things foresight, he sees that this is all going to come to a head soon. So he's, like, gloating to Ford, like, well, Bill comes out like, and now the end is near. <laughs> <laughs> also, I think it's an out-of-character moment as well for Alex Hirsch, who is voicing mm, Bill. Yeah. You might see the Pines family again. I don't know if... I don't know if in a choose your own adventure book or maybe an official version of journal three. I don't know a graphic novel. It's an acknowledgement to the audience that this is the finale, but yeah. you might like, yeah. yeah. Um, and interesting that, um, on the podcast, uh, everything's coming up. Simpsons. He talked about like a formative moment being terrified by uh, Bart's Comet episode of The Simpsons, which is all, the like... Moment, the moment when um, they w try to launch something at the Comet, but they get the trajectory wrong, and it breaks the last it, bridge out of town. Out of Alex, in that moment, was the first time in any fiction he had seen that everything might not turn out okay. And even though it's a joke and everything is okay at the end of the episode, and what do they sing at the end of that one? Yeah, that's Que Sera Sera, which Sera is a Sera. similar <laughs> vibe by, to by Will Doris Day. Yeah. But yeah, in that it hadn't even occurred to him that a solution to a problem might go away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and death became very apparent to young Alex. So for him to A, sing, which is something that historically he hasn't done on this show. Yeah, did, and, and didn't we just say that they, they had to cut the whole Bill song because it was it, mostly for actually, time, mm, but it was also that's the because. Second, the last episode, part of the reason they cut it was. That Alex couldn't sing in the voice, but they also cut a McGucket song about the Gobblewonker from the second episode oh. because he couldn't sing in the McGucket <laughs> voice. He does sing it several times though, but that's just his voice. Well, that's also layered on top of other voice. But to, for him to sing and also to like have this association with these images of nuclear holocaust is like it's an interesting like meta thing for for Alex to do toward the audience. Um, I'll, I'll also say that song reminds me of "I Will Always Think of You" from BoJack Horseman. BoJack, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and it's interesting to me that uh, I, another just meta, 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 meta level to all this is like you know that's an existing song, that's a real song, and I mm -hmm. don't think that's happened before on this show. I might, or well, I mean, nine to five. 
uh, was in Boss Mabel, but mm-hmm. for a character to sing yeah, an existing yeah. real world song is always interesting to me. Like that's why. Like, well, you know, Bill learned that when he was visiting our universe before he went over to the uh, cartoon. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I, Kubrick was probably in this universe too. How, did, how else did they do the moon landing? Right? <laughs> Can we talk for a second about um, the uh, the various uh, apocalypse glow ups uh, when they get into the mystery yeah. shack? I, I, what I, I want to point out first. Dipper is rocking that W neck. Seuss was right. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even catch that. Oh my god! It wasn't on purpose at all. The commentary for this episode is Rob Renzetti, Alex Hirsch, and Jason Ritter. Jason points that out, and Alex and Rob go, uh-huh. <laughs> yep, we did that. Uh, <laughs> I, I did, did this. this. On Peppis. <laughs> <laughs> I think my my favorite of uh, aside from uh, the bodacious T, who just like that's the objectively yes. favorite, the number one. Yeah, Toby has never put his own personality at the forefront. This entire show, he has always just been focused on Chandra Jimenez. The reporter. And when he's finally like, this is who I want to be, he gets a job with mm-hmm. her. Yeah. I, I think uh, my favorite is definitely Candy with that uh, kind of aviator hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Candy also has war yeah, paint. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, Gr- Candy and Grenda definitely look the most Mad Max out of all of them. <laughs> um, I think the multi bear has like a couple eye patches on some of his bear heads. <laughs> And, like, any one of these characters that were originally voiced by a celebrity, Larry King, Multi-Bear, I th- I think maybe several times. I think I heard Lance in there, but I maybe double Maybe it's possible. Um, <laughs> we have several injuries. That line killed me. <laughs> ah, my liver, girl. Yeah, this is an insanely star-studded <laughs> episode with... Larry King. <laughs> Alfred Molina talking about how he's taken Shiatsu yeah. classes. Yeah. Uh, we got, we got uh, Brack. We got <laughs> and like They always get the guest stars to say the stupidest <laughs> lines. They made the house into a robot. Fascinating. The more obvious it is that they are voiced by a guest star, the weirder the lines yeah. are. Yeah. So Larry King, Wax Larry King's whole personality is just saying the weirdest stuff they can write. <laughs> he wants num nums. <laughs> Larry King's disembodied yeah. wax head wants num nums. <laughs> so we get a little, we get a little taste of a uh, Bill Cipher's backstory here. We we learn that he comes from the second dimension and that he found it uh, not liberating enough. So he destroyed that dimension apparently <laughs> yeah i love the uh i love the idea of like the the uh, it, it the, going through bill's backstory definitely made it clear how his temptation of ford would like that is that is the thing that i fe- could definitely see ford being tempted by of the idea of like this world is too limiting for you and i'm uh, going yep. to give you ultimate power and like so that kind of uh um that kind of uh dichotomy or whatever of just like oh we're we're getting bill's backstory and i could totally totally see ford feeling the same thing or even you know, Dipper feeling the same thing if he didn't, you know, have the Mabel around. Bill is tempting Ford in the same way that Ford tempted Dipper. Yeah, yeah. And Bill appeals to Mabel at the end of Sock Opera as a fellow being of chaos. So it really feels that the reason Bill is stalking the Pines family, trying to merge the dimensions, is he sees himself in them in some way. In all of them, really. He's a con artist. There's traits of each of the Pines family that Bill has, but... This episode proves once and for all, we are not Bill. Yeah. And the parallel that I always felt was the strongest was to Mabel. Because Bill, what Mabel just learned in the previous episode, that, like, sometimes there are natural rules that you just can't bend, and, like, you just have to make the best of that. Bill refuses to learn. And he Mm, wants to be like, no, why should I have to, like, you know, be pulled toward the the earth by gravity? Why should time have to move forward only one direction? Like, why? Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Bill would have been an anti-masker. <laughs> oh, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, God. <laughs> However, I am a big fan of the vaccines. I want all of them inside my body. Give me all- more. I want, give me more. I love needles. I love needles in my arm. <laughs> They're like, you said it could make me sick. Oh, baby. <laughs> to be fair to Bill, I think for Bill to be wearing a mask, it would also be an eye patch and he couldn't see I think B. I think yeah. Bill sees all. That's true. 
Bill can actually see out of any depiction of an all-seeing eye. Oh, that's, so nah, he would that's just, true. If he wore the mask, he would just have to carry around a one dollar bill. <laughs> and, yeah, and that's why he can drink out of that <laughs> one oh, eye. God, I did not like that. I did not like any of the weird yeah. eye stuff in this episode. Ah, there's a lot of weird eye stuff in yeah. this Don't episode. Like, like they're thing, they're yeah. battling a monster that is an eye. Yeah, yeah. there's you no, know that there's couch no is way made out of living human oh. skin. Oh boy. Bill's backstory also, again, has, uh, I think, believe from the Bill Cipher AMA, he's made some parallels to Flatland, which is a series of yes. sci-fi novels about a world populated by 2D shapes. And yeah, so when someone yeah. asked about Bill's um, dimension, he just responds to look up the author of the Flatland <laughs> children's yeah. novels. So this kind of, this connects to that. And it also connects to uh, what I believe Alexa was theorizing about, where what if we traveled into Bill's mind? And that... <laughs> Even though that didn't happen, I love that idea, and like I am, that made me so excited to think about. Like, what if you turn the tables on him, and now that he is exists in the physical realm, you can go into his mind because he has mm-hmm. that now because he is physical. Yeah, if somebody did the sacrifice play, they could have, you know, possibly have maybe have as a spirit Absolutely. be able to. Yeah, do that. And that's, yeah, yeah. That was my favorite part about doing this podcast because I am overly familiar with this show this show has been my primary source of income since 2015 when i got enough views on what probably happened in gravity falls to start monetizing my youtube i i i've seen every angle i uh, but but for fresh eyes to come in the yeah. what ifs for the the theories that were wrong are my everything because I'm like that is a show I have you're describing a television show I haven't seen all of. <laughs> exactly <laughs> and so when Alexa I said it before with with Alexa um, saying that maybe Stan had been cloning himself for years I'm like that is a completely different season two B and I need to watch <laughs> it <laughs> mm-hmm. because honestly I love this show this is one of my favorite TV shows of all time. I adore every moment of it. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's so little that I would change about it. I don't like doing the same job for seven years. So it is entirely possible that you have just joined me through my last time watching wow. Gravity Falls. Oh. I might watch it again someday. I might not. How, how exciting. exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how uh, how badass was that electric guitar oh, remix so of the theme? Oh Mario? yeah! Oh, it was so good. Oh yeah, that was performed by session electric guitarist Andrew Sinowick. He also performed the electric guitar on "Let It Go" in Frozen. <laughs> so he got him to come in and, and lay that track down uh, during the the Shacktrons. And what an idea to make it into a mecca, like to make the shack. In Dipper's canceling the apocalypse speech, it gives a little bit of Pacific Rim vibes. Yeah. Originally, there were a lot of pot shots at Pacific Rim in this episode, um, which were just cut because it was like it took away from the drama. Mm -hmm. There was a joke about like, my robot can only be piloted by two twins. And Dipper and Mabel are like, why? Um, but they found, but Alex, after cutting those, found out that Guillermo del Toro is a huge fan of the show because he has children in the right age demographic. And so he was like, I am so glad we did not just make fun of one of our viewers for the entire final episode. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think the, the, the jokes about Seuss have, the teaching McGucket about anime is the right amount of levity for that sequence yeah tv finales the last episode always uses the theme song yeah. as a yeah. i'm a sucker like i know avatar the last airbender did the same thing where they had their theme music used in the finale battle that's how you know and it's gonna go yeah, that's where it's really happening <laughs> and they um the shacktron itself is basically just built from callbacks you've got the mystery shack protected by the the unicorn hair spell thing You've got, I believe there's parts of the Gideon robot in there. There is a uh, Gravity Falls billboard. The portal has been built into the crotch of the robot, um, which is a lovely image. And the gobble is attached, the robot gobble And <laughs> partly encased in tree sap is the T-Rex from Land Before Swine. That they have as an arm. Yeah. That whole mech, but really this whole episode really made me think, is there any previous episode of Gravity Falls that is not specifically called out in this episode? Because it feels like they were trying yeah, to put in at least everything. one thing from everything. I think they did. I think they did, honestly. Which bottomless I really pit? thought about it. 
Um, good question. <laughs> I'm sh- there might be like well, a. Prop- what about Mermando? We didn't. Did we see anything with Mermando? Oh, yes, oh, gone. yes, because the tree at the end had Mabel's uh, hearts with all her crushes. Oh, so yeah. I believe he's oh, on what, about the the what about the pinata? What about the pinata? Alexa, there's this great website. They call it Archive of Our Own. Yes. And so, if there is something that didn't happen in a series that you yeah. watched mm-hmm. and you feel that you need to vindicate that. You actually can write this little thing called a fan fiction. Oh, I'm aware. I want yes. to I want to read Alexis Gravity Falls fan fiction. We're all fictions. looking forward to the We've been impatient for the Pinata fix since June 5th, Alexa. Like <laughs> just come on. please a year also ago. include the president's key cuz I really need uh, that to come back. That's going to be the title yeah. of the episode, The Pinata and the President's Key cuz they both begin with exactly. the letter P. Exactly. And it's going to be about the two of them going on a homeward bound yeah. journey to get back into the <laughs> to show. To try to make oh. it in time for the finale, and they just miss it. I was going to say, I already know what the climax for that is. Like, uh, you know, I think <gasps> the pinata and the president's key have a conversation, and I think uh, the pinata says, I don't think we have to be there for everything. Aww. I don't think everything has to show up. And then the president's key was like, but I've been, I've been training for this moment. And the pinata was like, Listen, I've been made for a long time and nobody has taken a bat to me. Oh. Like, and at some point, <laughs> I'm just going to have to accept that I'm just going to live with Candy, you know? And, and, and then she moves in with mm-hmm. Candy and her parents. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now I have Candy on the outside. <laughs> as well exactly. As the so inside. I think it's going to be a journey of, you know, because uh, nobody ever talks about the callbacks that never made it, right? So I think that's going to be a good little set. Oh, yeah. I wish. I wish they never talked about the. That'd be great. Now Alex Hirsch would get some great night's sleep if no one ever <laughs> talked about the callbacks that <laughs> yeah. never made it. Like the baby. If no one ever talked about the baby. No one ever talked about yeah. that baby. No one had any questions about the baby. <laughs> Who is Dipper and Mabel's grandpa? Don't worry about it. Is it that baby? Who is Shermie? Don't, Don't worry, worry about, about it. it. Yeah. The imagery of like a, a giant robot with a T-Rex for a fist punching a monster with electric guitar in the background just gave like epic mealtime bacon 2007 <laughs> vibes <laughs> to me. And I love it. Like, it's great. It's great. Yep. Don't get me wrong. But it is like... This is so epic mustache bacon. Yep. Oh, my God. <laughs> this episode is complete excess. Alex said yeah. they tried to write their weirdest jokes, their strongest action. They Everything everyone liked about the series, they tried to do it more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's 100 times more powerful than most of episodes. <laughs> well, it's because it's a dragon. It is. Yeah. yeah, I was about to say, it's the dragon form. Yeah. The dragon form of Gravity Falls, there which was, is a hundred um, times more powerful. There was a cut <laughs> subplot from part of this episode where Dipper clones three and four were going to come back and, like, fight Dipper because they wanted to go home instead of Dipper. They wanted to go back to California. Well, that wasn't even a cut subplot. There was supposed to be... Because, yes, the Stanley recovering his memory was a little rushed because... They tried to write an episode about Stanley recovering his memory as Dipper and Mabel try to go home to California. And they were like, oh, this is incredibly depressing to just focus on their uncle not remembering them for 22 entire minutes. Yeah. This feels like a whole scourging of the Shire uh, type of thing where it's just like this this whole other tragedy that happens after the big battle that, that we have to deal yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. And then while Dipper and Mabel were away in Oregon, um, their parents, assuming they died against the dragon that I just spoke of, sold all their stuff. Oh, wait. But uh, we do get to see uh, Dipper clones three and four in the credits. They are still alive. They are just camping out in the rain. In raincoats. Thank you, (laughs) Patreon.com slash Mystery (laughs) Shack. Our patrons, they bought uh, raincoats. Mm -hmm. They're working on getting themselves laminated, I heard. And, you know, they're just Um, just out there being a couple of guys. Just guys (laughs) being guys. A couple of paper-based guys being guys. (laughs) So my hands-down favorite moment in this entire episode the old switcheroo. <laughs> How did we feel about that? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I personally prefer the new switcheroo, but that's not Stan and Ford's That's flavor. not what they're, they did, though. They did the old they're, one. They're, they're old. They're, they're, it's theirs. Look, it's old. It's classic. <laughs> <laughs> it's classic. Michael, were you going to say something Stan, about that? Stanley, what, what about the, uh, why don't we try the new switcheroo instead? Hey, ah, hey, these kids wouldn't know. If it ain't broke. These kids wouldn't know a good switcheroo if it bit them in the butt. (laughs) The switcheroos back in my day. The old switcheroos. (laughs) All right, what you got, Michael? 
Well, yeah, no, I, I love that. Um, at first, I thought that they weren't going to do it because like, I was like, okay, well, it seems like they're setting it up. Maybe they maybe they didn't uh, actually switch places. And like, did uh, maybe I just didn't hear it, but like, were Alex Hirsch and J.K. Simmons uh, trying to tried, do impressions of each they other? They tried voicing it like that and it didn't really work out, but the delivery is really weird and I think I know what's happening. And don't quote me on this. But I, just as okay. someone who does voice acting and voice direction a lot and comparing it to a clip from a movie Ella doesn't want to talk about. Uh, <laughs> um, I think Alex recorded his Ford impression with the lines and then they were fed in the headphones to J.K. Simmons and he just repeated the delivery mm. and vice versa. Wait, what movie do I want to talk oh. about? Um, there's a scene where Hermione, disguised as Helena Bonham oh, Carter's yeah. character, goes into the bank that's an interesting and way of doing it. Had, they had Emma Watson record it first and and then gave um, Helena Bottom Carter enough time yeah, to study you could, Emma you Watson. You could also say that uh, in Thor The Dark World when Chris Evans go. does that with, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> with Tom Hiddleston. There's definitely a noticeable gruffness to, to quote-unquote Stanford's voice that is not usually present yeah. mm-hmm. that suggests... Yes. Yes, and um, I've heard Alex imitate um, J.K. Simmons a lot, and there the del- that's why I thought that because he does it in the commentaries and such, and the delivery of Ford here, even though that is J.K. Simmons, reminds me of Alex's J.K. Simmons impression. So when did each of you realize that they did the switch? Was it when Stan was revealed the- to be in there, or was it before? And if so, when? I think I was starting to suspect it when we entered the White Void. Um, because yeah. I immediately my my brain went to like oh head empty type thing. Um, because let's... Stanford's mind would be filled with pictures of himself. <laughs> right. Exactly, and um, so I think that's when I started to suspect it. Uh, but I I I definitely wasn't like fully like oh this is what happened until he opened the door to see yeah. Stan on the the chair. Stanford's brain is just the Stanford Pines Honorary Museum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought what happened was uh it was going to be like another emotional thing that what was inside Ford's mind was Stan and their Aww. brotherhood. And I was like that's why I was like, "Oh." <laughs> then it turns out I was like, "Oh wait, never mind. They switched." <laughs> yeah, you're in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I started to be suspicious when they both were talking in the cage and we weren't zooming in on them. Mm. Right. And there's a very like, don't do it, Ford. Yeah. He'll de- he'll destroy you. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And um, the way their stubble is different, one is a gradient and one isn't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And they reverse that on the character designs for that scene. And uh, the chin cleft. Yes. But chin mm-hmm. that, yep. that Ford has is transferred onto what we think is Stanley. Mm-hmm. And Stanley, um, so Ford, when he... It makes the uh, zodiac circle puts on gloves, and that becomes critical because uh, they are six fingered gloves. Stanley has to convince Bill, and the Bill can see into people's minds. He just got so excited at the idea of getting into Stanford's mind. He's incredibly cocky at this stage. He he literally could have been like, "Wait, that's Stanley," but he got so ahead of himself. He was so convinced he won. It was like yeah. how the Nazis fell for every decoy we sent them. All of them. 100%. It was really <laughs> easy to trick them into thinking they won. But the now gloveless Stanford disguised as Stanley still has six fingers, obviously. Mm-hmm. But Stanley disguising himself as Ford is able to do it because of the gloves. He just like... Now, what is... Is Ford doing anything to hide his hands in that scene? Not particularly, but... can you? Does he have again, six fingers in that scene? He does. He is drawn with six fingers. Wait, Stanley's design is drawn with six fingers in that scene? Yep. He is drawn with six fingers and the chin Holy clip. shit! I never noticed yep. that. <laughs> Granted, you probably don't see a close-up until after the reveal, because he has to pull out the memory gun, and that's probably when you see his hands most clearly. But it's a great scene, and it's a great, like, payoff just to the whole theme of twins, right? Because I feel like that's such an easy, like... There's, like, a jokes on Rugrats about, like, oh, yeah, me and Lil switch places all the time. Nobody <laughs> notices. We just switch the bow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's just such a good, like, yeah, ugh, I love it. And I love that it's the one member of the Pines family who has never directly interacted with Bill is the one to 
take him down because mm. he is the one person who's like a better con artist than Bill <laughs> exactly. Baker. Well, yeah, that's exactly it. Is and Ford points it out is Stan is immune to Bill. Literally. Yeah. The reason Stan and Bill have not interacted is because that wouldn't work because Stan can see through every lie. Mm. He is a better <laughs> con exactly. artist. So it had to be Stan versus Bill because no one else could defeat <laughs> Bill. <Right>. Exactly. <laughs> and Stanley Stanley Pine saved the world by doing the same thing he's been doing for the last 30 years, pretending to be Stanford Pine. That is <laughs> yeah. what he is best oh, at wow. doing. That's wow. awesome. Wow. I bet he had to do the voice when he when he visited Dipper and Mabel's parents. And wear, yeah, wear gloves with a <laughs> uh, Hello, it, it's me, Stanford Pines, your your um uncle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm yep. very smart. I have twelve PhDs. Did I mention that? Science. Well that sounds like Stanford to me. I have one in I don't know, smarty pants stuff, and one in I don't know, numbers. <laughs> so as Bill is being erased by the memory gun, which, okay, my whole rant from the last Mabel Corn episode, the idea that you can erase Bill from someone's mind with the memory eraser, that was to set up this. But the fact that, like, you know, Ford says when they're talking in the cage, Bill's only weak in the mind space. If I didn't have this darn plate in my head, we could just erase him with the memory gun when he steps inside my mind. That's all they needed to put in Last Mabel Cord. Well, also, Last Mabel Cord was written in three days, so he's like, and Weird Mageddon Part 3 was already probably already being written, so he could be like, ah, uh, we could put in foreshadowing. Awesome. That's true. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. Before uh, Bill is punched out of existence by Stan, uh, actually, that whole sequence where Bill is, is making all these wild transformations, uh, and then Stanley finally punches him. Uh, that was all animated in-house by Dina Terrace. That was another sequence that they really wanted to get right, uh, yeah. and they did. Similar to Ford stepping out of the portal, it was like, if we want a shot that is so important to the plot of the show that we want it done exactly, we cannot send it overseas. Mm -hmm. And Dana had already offered to do additional animation if they needed, so... Yeah. yeah. But as Bill is getting erased, unfortunately, the only way to do that is to erase the entire mind. Mm -hmm. So you just erase the person's identity, and it erases their mind. Mm -hmm. Because normally that machine just picks out specific memories. And so some people were like, why didn't you just type in Bill Cipher? But that would only erase memories of Bill Cipher. I don't think that would yeah. actually yeah. destroy him. Yeah. yeah. It needed to erase his entire mind while Bill was in it. So he couldn't leave, basically. So I, I kind of have a, a gripe with that. There's kind of like a similar story arc that Doctor Who did. That's not usually a good sign. Go on. So... Uh, <laughs> It wasn't that they trapped like a person inside a uh, a person's mind. A certain character was given too much too much knowledge. Like a human being was given way too much knowledge, and mm -hmm. yeah. they basically became uh, unstable. And if they remember, like if they if they start to remember any of these things, like they will destroy the universe. Essentially, mm -hmm. they'll destroy themselves as well like as the, the crystal universe. skull. Ca yeah, exactly sure. like the crystal skull. Sure. Michael remembers plot points of that film. So, yeah. yes. <laughs> Interdimensional being. Right. But the point is that uh, the, the catch is we're going to erase this person's memory. But if they ever remember me, like the doctor, yeah. they will die and the world will die. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if they if they're at a at the doctor's office, it's like okay, the doctor will see you now. The doctor, the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, I mean, and they play <laughs> into that. Like uh, they there are moments that like at, in se later seasons where they're like, I'm starting to remember, and they're like, oh no 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 no, uh -oh. and like Wait, quick, you know, whack him over the head again. Pretty much, <laughs> pretty much, just like uh, uh, I I really hate the episodes where they whack her over the head. It's yeah. just uncomfortable to watch. She's a middle aged woman, so. <laughs> I, <laughs> I guess my my thought process here is okay. Well, if Grunkle Stan was able to get his memories back, doesn't that mean that technically, like Bill might still survive in there? You're skirting on halls of conspiracies territory. Oh, so. sorry, you're right. You're to right. To me, right. Bill is external. Bill did. The Bill was not created in Stan's mind, so he can't. Okay, be recreated by Stan's mind. That's how I justify it. Sure, that makes sense. When Weird Mageddon is restored and the world is brought to normal. The physical presence of Bill, the pyramid, is turned into just what it would have been without his magic stone. 
Yeah, which I love. I love the idea that we didn't see him, like, he doesn't turn into stone when he enters someone's mind previously because he never had a physical form. But his physical mm. form was stone. We see the bricks on the pyramid rotate. So that's essentially his corpse that's just, like, left behind. Gave me some spirited away energy there. It was pretty great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> when he turns into stone, a bird lands on his hand. We were not allowed to mention this in our first episode. But at the end of the unaired pilot, the king of the gnomes, voiced by Justin Roiland, having his riddle solved, turns to stone, and then a bird lands upon his hand. Oh. So, I the first time I watched this, I was, like, sick or something. Like, something was, like, putting me in this headspace where I was just, I was loopy, like, all day. And so, I was already, like, a mess for most of the day. And when, like... That last 10 minutes of the episode, I was just bawling from, like, Ford finally admitting that you're our hero, Stanley, is, like, Aww. that's where I start. And then, like, uh, Mabel saying goodbye to Candy and Grenda, and Mabel maybe having to say goodbye to Waddles were the other two. Oh, yeah, that got yeah, me! Yeah. <laughs> Can't have that. <laughs> and the Stan War 2, Seuss running the shack, like, all of this just... I was not doing great in that moment <laughs> in time. <laughs> they really did an excellent job with like all of the emotional payoffs. And, you know, I guess it also just goes into what you were saying at the beginning of this episode of just like, we can take something that was started as a joke, like Seuss wanting to be Mr. Mystery and uh, make it into just something emotional by putting it at the end. Yeah. So the very first Gravity Falls joke there was was when Alex would pitch this series to the friends, he'd be like, it, it's a it's a weird place where the townspeople are like the Simpsons and the mysteries are like Erie, Indiana or Mist, and there's Futurama continuity and it takes place in the Pacific Northwest because of my vacations with my grand aunt. They're like, oh, mysteries uh, in the Pacific Northwest, like Twin Peaks. And Alex said, I don't... Um, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. what now? <laughs> and that happened. That was the first Gravity Falls joke. Like Twin Peaks. And so even before beginning work on the pilot, Alex said, I better reference it instead of accidentally rip it off. <laughs> yeah. I decided to sit down yep. and watch Twin Peaks. Yep. And the very last return in this series is the return of sorts because the bus driver is voiced by Kyle McLaughlin. And in the commentary, Alex just said it made so much sense for Coop to take Dipper and Mabel home. Mm -hmm. So even yeah. though he's blonde and overweight and specifically drawn to not look like Coop, the intention of the casting is Agent Dale Cooper is there to take Dipper and Mabel home. Mm -hmm. Aww. Yeah. They're in good hands. They got the protagonist of Twin Peaks, so... I mean, excellent, excellent. Very good. Damn fine. Yeah, yeah it's like uh, it's like Miles Morales buying his first Spidey costume from. I mean, obviously we got to have the obligatory Stan Lee cameo, but that is the most like necessary to yeah. the character. This actually exactly. means that something. The fact that it's the creator, you know, one of the the creators of Marvel, Marvel giving Spider Man his costume. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And yeah, so um, it is Agent Dale Cooper who had been tirelessly compared to Dipper and Mabel to Alex. Yeah. Leading him to need to do research. Diane, I've just taken two children and a pig on my bus. Uh, we're driving to a town called Piedmont, California. <laughs> I'm hoping to get some pie. Diane is dispatch at the bus station. <laughs> 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 all right, just just make sure you're you're back in time, all right? You, we got other passengers, okay? <laughs> I, I adore this credit sequence. It's There's so many good little bits. My favorite, obviously... Marius and Grenda on <laughs> Marius' yacht. Just, 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 just make it out. Well, because we previously saw that Grenda could not match his energy for the relationship yet. Mm -hmm. um, so when he's like bashfully like, can we kiss? She's like, oh, yeah. And finally, you know, because he fell in love with her instantly and she needs to get to know him. And that's fine. She's Grenda. It's normal. Yeah. You can't fall slowly uh, in love with Grenda. It's Grenda. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was uh, some unused uh, little vignettes for this montage boarded by Emmy Sisiriga. Uh, that you can watch in the description. Mm. I I also love um uh, the the Mabel uh drawing hearts on the 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 tree and and I'm glad somebody pointed out to me that the last one is Mabel plus Mabel uh because that is definitely one of those lovely like 
uh, learning to love yourself as an important thing. So there's a lot of characters arcs paralleling because that's mm-hmm. also what Bodacious T went through. Yeah. <laughs> bodacious T plus Bodacious T. I think I predicted that Mabel was going to fall in love with someone who was like, it, it had to be someone really special that Mabel deserved and Mabel deserves herself. So there you're right. <laughs> also, also imagine, imagine. Chandra being fascinated by Bodacious T and asking him out and he's like, uh, I'll check my schedule. That's exactly what I think happens. That's my head canon. But yeah, R- Mabel did a did a Rebecca Bunch there. <laughs> Reminds me of of my friend in high school who had a bunch of relationships and then learned to love themselves and uh, just and and then that made me feel a little emotional for for my good high school Aww. friend. And that person was me. And we love him too. <laughs> and after the credits, nothing of particular interest happened. I guess I right? disagree. What did you see? Something there is. What I'm pretty sure is live action footage of the Bill Cipher statue. Oh. Huh. I wonder what that could be. Well, we legally cannot talk oh, about you know it here, folks. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. I think we gotta I think we gotta head on to uh that place where we do that stuff, you know? Ladies and gentlemen, right this way to the Hall of Conspiracy. conspiracy. I'm kind of surprised that we're we're still coming here. I, I didn't know that there would still be new exhibits in this hall to see. Oh. Well, after it got unweird Mageddonified, uh, we actually got some new exhibits in the aftermath. Mm-hmm. As well as because this is the end of the television program Gravity Falls, that means no fan theories will ever be confirmed or debunked. Mm. Which means the Hall of Conspiracies. He's eternal. Mm. And do you really think you're going to stop these nerds from making theories? No. Even that's true. Know there's no <laughs> more show. True. I tried. Believe me, this was my job for seven years. I tried. <laughs> I mean, there's definitely, and I'm sure we're going to get to it in one of these conspiracies, but probably the biggest mystery for me that remains unanswered is what is special about Gravity Falls that it's a weirdness magnet and Bill cannot leave. Yeah. I love that a lot of those questions are intentionally not answered because it yeah allows this fandom speculation to continue so in a lot of ways it's intentional that, yeah. that they wanted to keep the hall of conspiracies open. and and also it's if if they leave loose ends if they ever did want to do mm-hmm. also true an also official true. version of journal three something silly yeah. like that who who would do that robert zetty would do that <laughs> yeah he would but will he we'll see so we have the entire cipher wheel. What we now know is uh, referred to by Bill as the Zodiac, which yeah. is, is interesting. Oh, yeah. I was also wanting to ask, like, I mean, th- th- this maybe it's not a conversation with the Hall of Conspiracies, but just calling it a Zodiac really just made me think if the fandom has, like, established in the similar idea that, like, Western astrology Zodiac has people's signs associated with, you know, what, oh, what day you wanna, of the year. Oh, we got it. I, I'm going to guess your, your signs then. Okay, Michael's a question mark. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Alexa's a shooting star. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For sure. David's a bit of a pine tree at times. Absolutely. He's wearing a pine tree. And the cap. <laughs> Ella? I'm a ten of telepathy star. And I'm both a uh, a Pac-Man and a six-fingered hand. <laughs> yeah. A, a six-fingered hand with a Pac-Man tattooed on it. Yeah. If only there was some kind of, uh, I don't know, some pirate from New Jersey who wants to punch the crack in. Who also is overeducated and knows too much about too many things. You know, someone who's kicked out of their family's house, but also is destined for greatness and has to deal with ego. I don't know anybody like that. The cipher wheel being officially referred to as the Zodiac did allow me to make a video in which I sentence mixed Bill saying, Didn't you brainiacs know the Zodiac killed his Ted Cruz? <laughs> because that's back when Ted Cruz was funny and... You know, I, I go as far as to say... Ted Cruz will always be funny because hating him is a great way to bring people together. That's true. So let's read off these symbols. Dipper is the pine tree. Mabel is the shooting star. Seuss is the question mark. Gideon is the little old tent of telepathy star. An excuse to stand next to Mabel. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I won't. I will. Ford is the six-fingered hand. Pacifica is the llama. Boo! Should have been waxed Larry King's head. Boo! (laughs) 
He could have held. He could have had them like stick their hands in his mouth to Listen, hold it. I think this hand. is one of the only near perfect series I've ever seen. I say near because the law should Larry have been King. Wax Larry King's head. <laughs> Come on. Oh. Actually, no. Now that I now that I've experienced this with Alexa, it should have been the pinata. Mm. You're yeah. right. Right. Robbie is the stitched heart, his destiny hoodie. Wendy is the ice bag, cool under pressure. McGucket is the glasses, because he's scholarly. And he wears glasses. And he wears glasses. Look, Dipper. <laughs> look, Dipper, see, McGucket wears glasses, so he's the glasses. <laughs> but uh, they don't really they don't really look at all like McGucket's... They look more like Blubs' glass. No, 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 don't. It's McGucket. Uh, maybe, McGucket. maybe Bodacious T's glass. No, it's McGucket. It's we're glowing already. It's working. That means I got it right. Stan is the Fez symbol. Even though he didn't end up making it work. <laughs> no. So this next one uh, is a theory that was posted on Tumblr by someone named Ella Chesery. Oh, what? 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 Do you know what? Wait a second. We're curating the exhibits, Ella. We're not supposed to be. Is there anything in the rule book that says a curator can't make an exhibit? Michael, check the check the Airbud official rule book. I'm, I'm checking it. I'm checking it. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it's museum law that all exhibits must be stolen, not, uh, you know, not created. Oh, so it belongs in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're right. There's no rule. There ain't no rule. It says the docent can't make an exhibit. So I was never, like, one to really, like, post, like, elaborate theories. I feel like I had a couple way toward the beginning of the series, and then as it went on, I was just like, let me just enjoy the ride. Mm-hmm. But toward the end, I really started to craft, like, a, a proper theory that well, I there, thought there weren't no ride no more. You were like, oh, let's go again, let's go again, and the theme park was closing, and you got home and took your 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 wheelie your office chair and asked your mom, push me, push me. She did, and it was very fun, but it wasn't the same. <laughs> so, so this was after the author was revealed to be uh, Stan's brother, um, and after that point, the theory it was kind of interesting because after like a tale of two stands, or after like you know last Mabel Corner, a certain point. There wasn't much left to theorize about because we kind of knew that everything at that point was revolving around Bill. Bill was going to do something and and it was going to culminate in something. We just didn't know what yet. And I was particularly interested in Bill's backstory, his motivations. And what I ended up coming up with that I thought might conceivably be what's going Mm -hmm. on is that there is some sort of species of all-knowing beings and they're hailing from, like, another dimension or space or something, I don't know, (laughs) and that they were connected to the UFO and that they were, in fact, the six-fingered hand and that Ford was the glasses because they were Mm. a lot like Ford's glasses. Mm. And I thought that this species had six fingers because in Hindu mythology, additional limbs and heads are considered a sign of power. In Hungarian mythology, having six fingers on a hand is held to be the sign of innate supernatural power. So, And there's a lot of, like, you know, having a third eye, having another, like, limb, having multiple limbs and stuff as being, like, mm-hmm. godly or, like, you know, having some kind of mystical power. Uh, so A Tale of Two Stands did debunk this part, but I thought that maybe the reason he had six fingers is because some of that mystical power was inside of Stanford or something, and that's why Bill wanted him. But what it boiled down to is that Bill was demoted from the ranks of that species, which is why he said in the AMA that he's angling for a promotion, Mm. that he knows lots of things, but he does not know everything. So what he wants Mm. is that last bit of power um, that will put him over the top and make him like actually all powerful rather than near omnipotent actually omnipotent what's interesting from a story standpoint because i knew alex like once said this thing about like fans tend to understand conspiracy math but not story math Mm -hmm. (laughs) because like Mm -hmm. a theory for a theory to come true it has to work in a story yep yeah so i made Mm -hmm. i was connecting bill thematically to dipper in that he wanted knowledge at any cost Mm -hmm. when really his motivations again there are pieces of the pines family of everyone in the Pines family in Bill, but motivation-wise, he's more like Mabel than I thought because he wants freedom from natural restrictions. So I was just connecting him to the wrong Pines twin. (laughs) (laughs) I also recently sat down with Miss Jukebox 8, if you recall Weirdmageddon 1, the person who introduced Michael to me and thus us to Pipe Dream Podcast, to talk about a very niche 
fan theory she has for this episode. Uh, ahoy, Miss Jukebox 8. Tell everyone what you do. Oh, yes. I uh, I have a YouTube channel called Miss Jukebox 8, which I've had for a while. It's kind of a little bit of everything. I especially love overthinking Homestar Runner. In fact, both of the times that I've been on a Pipe Dream podcast, it has been to talk about Homestar Runner. That's right. You were on uh, Come on, Fuku Pods. Which episodes was that again? Oh, I was on the ones for Teen Girl Squad issue one and Morning Routine. That that was the ones. So while thinking about Gravity Falls and Homestar Runner, of course, when you're a nerd who likes two things, uh, it's very enticing to think of the idea that they're t- both connected in some way. Bill Cipher is actually from the Homestar Runner universe, uh, or Free Country USA. The Homestar Runner universe is 2D, not just because of the art style, because but also Strong Bad's Cool Game for Attractive People advertisement trailer. Uh, they seem to be very unfamiliar with being in a 3D space. You think those chains are tight? Imagine living in the second dimension. Flat minds in a flat world with flat dreams. I liberated my dimension, Stanford, and I'm here to liberate yours. And also, uh, in the graphic novel Lost Legends that was done for Gravity Falls, there are two references to them living in a 3D world. Things are about to get two-dimensional. Say goodbye to your width. Oh, third dimension. Oh, I missed you. So, yeah. So, I, I think... There actually might have been one moment where we actually saw the destruction of Bill's home dimension. The original Weird Mageddon. Yeah, something like that. In episode 118, Virus, uh, Strong Bad gets a very interesting email that seems to be a lot of gibberish text. Earth Plus, Y76P, all you ain't... Uh, what is this? Did the quadratic formula explode? which gives his computer a virus, but the virus actually just uh, infects the entire website, or the universe within the website. Well, basically, reality starts warping, uh, stuff like the computer melting. There's a lot of surprising, like, connections between what Bill does in Weird Mageddon and what happens in the the virus email there's a one point where strong bad like you see him and his like facial features are kind of like mixed up a lot in places that they're not supposed to be like what mr northwest went through also most of the characters uh what happens to them is that they seem to be like forced into going into different art styles, which reminds me a lot of the weirdness bubbles. So what I think happened is that, basically, Bill, either he was the virus, or he just, like, created this virus to destroy his home world, and then just got the heck out of Dodge. Both times that Bill was defeated uh, was by the, the destruction of, like, the vessel that he was inside, either it be the computer or Grunkle Stan's mind, the computer was destroyed by Bubs, who is basically as close to Grunkle Stan as you could get in the Homestar Runner universe. He is also a con man. And that ties into the thing Ford was saying about why Stan would have been able to see through Bill's lies. Ah, don't blame yourself. I'm the one who made a deal with Bill in the first place. I fell for all his easy flattery. You would have seen him for the scam artist he is. It it seems that the only way to trick a trickster is with another trickster. Since he's 2D in the 3D world of Gravity Falls, it would only make sense that he would be 1D in the 2D world of Homestar Runner. And he has letters on the screen. He's, He's lies. Yes, he's a series of lines. I don't think it ends there. We, we discussed the virus email. I believe there is one other time when Bill Cipher has come to Free Country USA. See, Gravity Falls, it takes place in the summer of 2012. That, that's, that's been established. So, in the Homestar Runner universe, around 2015, there was something interesting that happened. Flash began to die. Woohoo, check it out. I'm vulnerable and should be updated. Haven't you heard? Flash is dying! The thing what creates us all! 
the sad truth is that Adobe stopped doing support for Flash Player around that time, or at least announced that they were going to, because they were concerned about, like, the security risks and all that. <gasps> Wait! <laughs> you mean that Adobe might have been worried about a virus? Or perchance 400,000 viruses? Yes, like viruses. So... Bill, I believe, is the reason that Flash, like, <laughs> so, died. So, so Virus was him trying and failing to kill Flash, but Flash is dead is him... He, got, he got there eventually. Uh, so, by the way, so while you're here, since you don't need to solve the mysteries of Gravity Falls anymore, do you think you can help me solve my own mystery? Because, like, mm -hmm. for, for a couple of years, I've been trying to figure out who wrote this message in a bottle signed M. Um, and I know you've been trying to figure out stuff uh, about that M guy who's friends with uh, Bill. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, one anyway, from that uh, old kid show, uh, The Letter People, that apparently only <laughs> I've seen. Uh, I thought maybe there might be a connection <laughs> there, and... Uh, so that's about all the time we have for today. You know, Mystery Shack uh, look back starts with an M. Uh, so and that's, so does Marlowe. Uh, about all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining hey, us. Hey, come back here. I will not be silenced. Ninja Raptor 4444, who um, is my arch nemesis. The, the Ninja vs. Pirate feud did not die down with the Naruto and One Piece fandom. <laughs> <laughs> Says... Anyone else reckon the statue of Bill at the end could have been left at the mystery spot at the Oregon Vortex when Alex and the crew did this? And then they link to the Gravity Falls wiki for Mystery Tour 2013, which was the road trip that um, Roadside Attraction was based on. While they were there, they left Bill drawings at every location for fans to find. If they had left anything else uh, during that time, well, they didn't post about it. Yeah, maybe it's a, maybe it's a real-life secret for people mm. to find. That would be, that'd be wild. So Michael's fan theory came up a lot. We don't have a direct source of it, but there were a lot that was like, if a racing... Stan's memory killed Bill, and his memory is back, is Bill back? And then the other one being, the Bill statue is forever posed with his hand out for a handshake. Mm -hmm. I was in an incredibly popular fan animation um, about Mabel wondering if she should try to shake its hand and seeing what will happen, mm. called Gravity Falls one year later. Me and Shelby voiced it um, yeah. by Alina923 on YouTube. So when Bill is dying, he shouts, You reverse that, you hear, A-X-O-L-O-T-L. He spells the word axolotl. So at the time of this episode, it was understood that that was how axolotl was pronounced and so that is in all gravity falls fan theories and and that is how this will be pronounced and that's how we're going to pronounce it because i can't find the correct pronunciation fast enough. but uh yes that is a that is an aztec word meaning uh water dog in the aztec language which it I is look at that thing that's a water dog if I've ever seen one. So there's a video here called Nahua, When a Language Dies, narrated in the the original tongue that we can link in the description by uh, the YouTube channel of Indigenous Americans. But uh, we're just going to be saying axolotl for a bit here. Sorry. So there's we'll meet again, and now there's that I may return. So there's a lot of like, maybe, mm -hmm. but how? Mm -hmm. Like It feels... Like, and, and maybe I'm mostly going off of that Alex Hirsch uh, blog post. It feels very much like Alex Hirsch uh, doesn't have any more stories that he wants to tell in this world and is not does not feel the need to keep expanding the mis the the Gravity Falls universe. And I think yeah. in that sense, the reason for this is not to promise that audiences will be able to experience some future story but is just continuing the idea that stories will continue here the mystery is not gone but it's... although once again there are additional stories and the podcast is not over don't unsubscribe to the feed <laughs> yes yes but i i guess by that i i can't really think of a uh different <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know. My my uh, thinking about the meta is is getting in the way of me trying to come up with well, anything here, else. Well, here, let me give you one that people had pieced together. There is a f- an empty fish tank behind the um, Lazy Boy and Dinosaur Head and television. Mm-hmm. And do you think when they do you think when they were building the Shacktron, the dinosaur was like, "What? Why do you have that?" <laughs> <laughs> but um. Sometimes, and I've never caught it myself, but I've seen screenshots, that empty fish tank does contain an Aztec water dog. As well as, um, I think when people were theorizing about it, they found that, like a lot of sea creatures, like sea stars and so forth, mm-hmm. the it, it has regenerative uh, abilities, like loses a limb, it can grow back, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So... It makes sense to invoke that in, you know, talking about coming back to life, I would say. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take a little bit of what David said, a little bit of what Ella said, because I think that even they definitely had that kind of ending that, you know, Mabel and Dipper are going to move on. However, the stories are still going to continue. Uh, it's kind of like. Uh, if any of you have seen Lost, <laughs> uh, it was probably one of the- you're comparing Gravity Falls well, to Lost. Oh, it's gonna be it's gonna be something. So there's this very unpopular episode where there were two islanders that were not featured in any of the episodes, and they had their. <laughs> and then suddenly in the season, they were just given lines like, "Hey, put that down," you know, like just random stuff. And like, who are you? Are the, they're extras that are talking now? I'm Islander extra number one. You know me, All right? And then they had a whole episode dedicated to them oh. on what was happening during uh, the big adventures. Like, they would have okay. their own mini-adventure. So that's what I think okay. is going to happen. You think the axolotl had its own <laughs> mini-adventures? Or during, the pinata. Like, hey, Absolutely. Hey, oh, oh, the, the pinata. pinata. Hey, where's the pinata? Michael, I don't think Seuss's management style will be one-to-one the same as the original Mr. Mystery. I don't think it'll be anything like it. He has too much heart, I feel like, to to scam people, people uh, as as uh, intensely as Grunkle Stan. That's true. And, and that's why his cashier, instead of being a teenager mm-hmm. who needs a job, is um, his girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and I also feel like, you know, she they'll they'll be able to uh, you know, I feel like I could also see Seuss kind of becoming a little power hungry within that and then she keeps him grounded. You know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Seuss and Melody also have the same favorite place of business, <laughs> Hoo-Ha the Owls Pizza Time Jamboree, so maybe they'll Oh, there's gonna be, oh, there's some, gonna be some animatronics oh, up in I already this. know. Like a, a stanimatronic. Old Goldie is long gone. He's moved to the Arctic Ocean with his husband. I also have a feeling yeah. like Seuss will have like a, an attraction where you get to whack the pinata. Like, he'll have a little bat, so instead of a whack-a-mole. Yeah. Well, now it's time to ask the question that has baffled mankind and Seuss kind for generations. What's the attraction? <laughs> <laughs> As well as his speech uh, in support of keeping the Mystery Shack open kind of reveals, like, what he sees about the Mystery Shack. Like, he sees it as encouraging people to, like, believe that these things are possible rather than just tricking them. Mm -hmm. It's more like, wouldn't that be cool? Dude, wouldn't it be cool if there was, like, a a mermaid (laughs) with, like, a a skeleton head on it? And for Stan, it's, um, if the electric bill stops being paid in this house i am never getting this portal running so i need to find a way to make money yeah exactly (laughs) yeah the lack of desperation will make the mystery shack a very different place yeah so i feel i feel like that we would first things first i feel like integration of kids is going to be essential i feel like that well yeah because they were he was leading them on a tour to show them the statue of the founder yeah and so like i feel like there's going to be more maybe they'll utilize the um you know the the adventures and just kind of like the skills that he learned by babysitting and also accompanying uh, Dipper and Mabel and into into yeah. those. Yeah, maybe he'll do like a story time where he tells the the adventures of of Dipper and Mabel to all the children that visit the mystery Ooh, shack while their parents around the, look the around. campfire. Absolutely, yeah. or the adventures of of Stan and Ford. Because he writes fanfics about Stan. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, that too. Who are now punching krakens in the Arctic Ocean. So Stan and Ford are freaking pirates now. On the Stan of War too. Well, they're going to go on an adventure with Mermando, who has moved to the Gulf of Mexico mm. uh, to stop a war with the Manatee people. Maybe they're going to get uh, mixed up in that 
Or somehow, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, maybe the marriage fell through. I don't know. Or maybe <laughs> maybe the manatee got kidnapped and, and they have to save the princess. And, um, well, that Kraken. Yeah. I bet I bet we're not seeing all of that Kraken. I bet, I bet she's actually quite nice if you get to know her. Yeah. Got a real southern <laughs> hospitality to her. After being stabbed in I'm the sure. eye, right? Exactly. Dipper and Mabel are planning to... They, they, it says at the bottom of the note, see you next summer. Mm-hmm. So... A lot of the fan speculation on what happens next, because, and I've tried making content about Blubs and Durland and about triggering powers, and no, it's not what it's about, and I didn't understand that. It should be, though. Dipper and Ma- people want to know what is going to happen to the people they fell in love with first. So Dipper and Mabel, Dipper in his new, Dipper changed his clothes for the first time in the show. That yeah, was cool. Yeah, and I feel like... <laughs> Wendy definitely never washes yeah, her hair. Yeah, we should definitely so. check oh, her lights just now. in case. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no, you don't got to check, dude. They're there. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea that every summer they that when he comes back, they just trade hats every summer. Oh, and that's their that's, thing. that's a popular fat there. Or, or he goes back the next summer and Wendy has a different hat instead of the pine tree hat. And he's like, what What happened? He's, and she's like, oh, yeah, I made friends with this other 13-year-old kid. And we had, a, we had a, a great winter break, so I gave him my hat at the end. Yeah this like precocious crush on me i had to let him down easy (laughs) it happens a lot and then he was like oh well did you still want this hat back and she was like oh yeah i actually got that from a different kid the last spring (laughs) break before you got here actually (laughs) that's a great theory (laughs) that's hilarious yeah i mean there was a whole school year in between wendy would have met some new freshmen Mm -hmm. Uh uh absolutely and i just just the the chain of hats continues oh so We've had backwards messages that teach us how to decode additional mysteries. And we've had ones that just make fun of the audience. But in a lot of ways, there are no additional mysteries. So at the beginning, you hear at the end of the theme song, but played backwards, that is. (laughs) The Visionaire cryptogram. Uh, at the end of the first half of the episode, which you wouldn't see in the hour-long version of the episode, but you do see on the Disney Plus version. Uh, the key is Shaktron, which are letters spread among the cans of the brown meat behind Stan. Hey, mystery shack look back at gmail.com. Are the letters still there in the hour-long version? Yeah. Tell us. Uh, but when you put that key onto this first half credit scriptogram, it reads... Seuss later forced McGucket to watch all 900 hours of Neon Crisis Mechabot Boy Revelation. Wonderful. Super Robot Monkey Team Hyperforce Go, dude! Also in that elusive Disney Plus first part that you can't find on the DVD, the combination cipher reads, Ten symbols placed around a wheel. Hand in hand, the bond the seal. But break the chain and pay the cost. The prophecy will all be lost. And because this is on an end card, I believe in the hour-long version, they just show two end cards. But this, of course, directly relates to, like, the end of the first half. With the... mm-hmm. There's also, like, a, a montage of those symbols in the credits of the first half. And in the second half on Disney+, Plus, you get a, a previously on. Yeah. That we hadn't seen before. Narrated by Zeus. Which I've never heard before this moment, actually. <laughs> I realized yeah. I have actually never watched Weird Begetting Part 4 somewhere in the woods. I've always just watched it as part of Weird Begetting Yeah, Begetting 3. I think, I don't know if they, I guess they work as halves, but I would watch it all, like, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't think I would ever watch them no. separately. When Dipper and Mabel are on the bus, there is a visionaire code on this one of the seats. Uh, once it's decoded, using the key phrase, Hidden deep within the woods, a buried treasure waits. It reads, secrets lost and statues found beyond the rusty gates. It seems to be correlating to statues, meaning the, the Bill statue. It's interesting because the key, the key phrase is kind of like part of the message, as yeah. well as the key phrase is not in the episode. So fans had to figure it out through guessing. And there's this great thread on Reddit that I will link to where they are in the process of solving it. It is amazing. How did people figure it out? Just brute force. Like brute Just brute force. Ha- the power of the community. That's crazy that you can brute force a visionary. Key. Yeah, apparently you can if you have enough nerds. Wow. A million nerds on a million typewriters will eventually decode every cryptogram. It's very interesting. 
And it's a great piece for our, for a time capsule. During the final end credits, there is a visionaire cryptogram that reads, Goodbye, Gravity Falls, using the key axolotl, uh, which is seen on the door frame leading to the living room as the pines lead Stan into the ruined shack. The final end card combination cipher reads, Faded pictures bleached by sun, the tales told, the summer's done, in memories the pines still play, on a sunny summer's day. And um, we had previously talked about how it seemed that the season two end cards lined up and the work was already done to show what was missing. So that made it pretty easy to create this final image. Uh, it is indeed Stan and Ford's heads uh, facing opposite directions with a big old triangle in the middle. That looks like it could be a playing card. Yeah, it's got kind of a tarot card vibe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to get a deck of cards with that as the back. Mm. Probably exists. Fans yeah. are wild. So I guess at this point, uh, we're not we're done covering Gravity Falls of the series on this podcast, but the podcast ain't over yet. <gasps> because next week... You all asked for it. You all wanted it. You, you were, were like, begging. shut up about Gravity Falls. You've been hyping up this Let It Shine podcast for an entire year. So next week, we are delivering you a podcast about the Disney Channel original movie that premiered before Gravity Falls, Let It Shine. Wow. Starting in July, episodes will be every other week instead of every week. This podcast Mystery Shack Look Back, a discussion on Gravity Falls, will end on August 31st, Dipper and Mabel's 23rd birthday. Oh, God, oh. I'm old. And then we will be back in October for a five-episode series on um, Over the Garden Wall, which will just be on this same podcast feed. Though. Yeah, so it'll be a little more more sporadic, but uh, we get you get to wrap up this whole time capsule podcast thing on Dipper and Mabel's birthday, which I think is pretty great. If you want to find more episodes of this podcast, go on down to our host network, PipeDreamPodcast.com, where you can find other shows like Escape from Vault Disney, How Did This Not Get Made, and Come On for Google Pods, hosted by our three fine guests in this episode. Yeah, thank you so much for having us on this monumentous uh, occasion, as well as just this show. It's been a great time. And I'll also say, uh, coming soon to that website, we have the pilot episode available for free at our Patreon page for Pipe Dream Podcasts. We are uh, hoping to start the actual podcast soon of Pod Made You Special, a VeggieTales podcast. <gasps> oh my god! Yes! <laughs> Jesus Christ Superstar! I had to reference that because we referenced it in the two other uh, Weirdmageddon podcasts. I did it! Our show's social medias, our Discord server, they're linked on that website as well. We also have a Patreon. Patreon.com slash Mystery Shack. We still got a whole summer of Mystery Shack look back, so you can still get a shout out at the end of the episodes for $3. You can still get into uh, an exclusive channel in our Discord where we will have uh, watch parties, we'll play some, some Jackbox, we'll play some games, we'll do fun stuff together, and $40 can still get you a voice commission from Charlie or an art commission from Ella. That's me. You can also check out our merch store at crowdmade.com slash collections slash mystery shack look back. You can contact us at mystery shack look back at gmail.com. How did you cope with the loss of Gravity Falls? <laughs> did you just sit out on your porch and stare into space? <laughs> that was me during the mid-season finale, but um, Brian, Brian, thank you for making the instrumental for our theme song and for voicing Stan in the Hall of Conspiracies intro. The Hall of Conspiracies intro is Lentil Dentist. That is a remix of our first episode by Sim and the Timbulb V2-0. There's a link in the description. Thank you to Tsunami Holmes on Tumblr for the Stanford handwriting font in our thumbnails. And Adam, thank you for uh, tricking our spit into traveling <laughs> into someone else's mind so that you can erase it from existence. That was, <laughs> that was really clever, Adam. I really respect that. Uh, also, please check out the Gravity Falls 10 Years Later zine project uh, that was put together by our wonderful docent, Abby Kirby, uh, and includes uh, work by one of our other wonderful docents, Mary McKeon, host of Into the Falls, uh, another Gravity Falls podcast that is also wonderful. 
Uh, so please check that out. Links in the description. It is fantastic, and you can uh, purchase it at, at multiple levels, and it will be donated to, I believe, Planned Parenthood is uh, where where that money is going. So that's fantastic. We are excited about that. Happy 10-year anniversary, Gravity Falls. So with uh, everything you've got coming up in the future, does that mean after Over the Garden Wall, you're just never doing any more podcasts ever again? Oh, I wouldn't be so sure about that, my good friend David Spencer, because, you know, I firmly believe, and I believe it so firmly that I am going to play the ukulele while I say this to you, I believe we'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Smiling through Just like you Always do Till the blue skies Drive the dark clouds Far away So will you Please say hello To the folks that I know Tell them I won't be long They'll be Happy to know That when you saw me go I was singing This song We'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Hey, YouTube Ford. Uh, hello, table read stamp. Care to explain what you're doing in my lab? Well, I uh, charged a bunch of people uh, a lot of money just to say their names. <laughs> Suckers. Anyway, there's a lot of them, and I don't feel like, uh, you know, reading them all myself. Uh, you want to do some? I have many moral objections to this, but you've tempted me with an organized list. Thank you, too. Daddy Driftwood. And Daddy Buttons. Friendly Local Geek. Fun Boringness. Hugh Salinas. Juno Series, I guess it's pronounced. Liz Clark. Uh, David, oh boy, okay. G uh, guns? Guns? Gansel? 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 You got it, yes, Gansel. Aren't you Mr. Fancy? I was voted Mr. Fancy five years running. Uh, don't remind me, I remember. Richard Scanland. Jamie Belts. I want to belt a couple of... Shots of whiskey after this list. Uh, go ahead. Ryan Faber. Uh, Stephen Patrick Mulholland. Oh, Mulholland Drive. Very interesting. Very interesting. All right. It's a good film. Gwen Prime. Junior Bruh. Joseph Jones. Olive Pluto. O Olive Ver. There's an R there, Stan. Oh, Oliver Pluto. I'm sorry. I was distracted by the, 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 the object that's no longer a planet at the end. Kuiper Object. That's the term. Whatever for <laughs> That was your thing, not mine. Oliver Pluto. Petey Piranha Plant. Uh, Elizabeth Neuenfeldt. Mumpleteen D. Wumpleteen. <laughs> oh boy, these kids these days. A uh, Vanillin Sucker. Zucker, not sucker. Whatever, they, he's a sucker. He might be a zucker, but he's also a sucker. Vanillin... Vanilla Zucker. Roe Davis. Adam with two A's, a D, and an M. Delphine... Dussy. Uh, May? Just me. Jesse Marie McDougal. B. Calisota. Rich Rawl. Easy Snake Oven. Samantha Angley. And Spencer Neil Campbell. Uh, Stan, what are all these patrons paying for anyway? Oh, you know, just the essentials. This brown meat doesn't buy itself. Nor does Fully Clothed Women magazine, evidently. Hey, keep your hands off that. Help me stock up for the apocalypse at patreon.com slash mystery shack.